Welcome back to the program. In Benue State, hundreds of youth have staged a protest in Makodi, the Benue State capital, to protest the alleged killing of 33 people by suspected herdsmen on Tuesday. The protest led to a gridlock, causing traffic obstruction for motorists traveling to the north and southern regions of the country. The aggrieved youth are calling on President Mohamed Buhari to intervene in what they described as terrorist executions in their state. This bond vehicle is one of the relics of the tragedy that greeted residents of Benue State in the wake of the New Year 2018. But the tragedy is more than this. Lives are involved. At least 33 are said to have gone with the massacre. Governor Samuel Otom visits for a personal assessment of the situation, but with an appeal for calm. Mr. President has been briefed about this development all the security chiefs have been briefed, and our security council directed that security men should come and protect lives and property in this community. These are the challenges that come with initiating a process that will ensure peace for all. For us, we believe that this is the best way. If anyone has a better option other than what we have done, bring it on the table. For the youths of the state, this is unacceptable, and so armed with placards, they storm the streets in protest. The arrival of this vehicle carrying more dead bodies further raised their tears. Time around 5:30, so we discovered that uh, those uh, headmen uh, come and surrender this place. Mm. And before we know, they started shooting people. So we don't even know what happened, and I, we don't even know the reason. That they killed about uh, eight security men there, which is a laughter guard. They killed eight men, and the other fellow member, even my younger brother, follow me. <laughs> While he promises to get to the root of the matter, Governor Otom adds that there is no going back on the anti grazing bill. On well, the head of the Roman Catholic Church in Congo has condemned the crackdown on protests against President Joseph Kabila, describing it as barbaric. The Cardinal Laurent accused security forces of opening fire on peaceful protesters and desecrating places of worship. According to the United Nations, security forces in the Democratic Republic of Congo killed at least seven people in the capital, Kinshasa. The Catholic Church is one of the few institutions in Congo to enjoy broad credibility. Some 40% of the population identifies as Catholic, and the Church's long filled voice in education, health care, and other services left by what many see as an absent state. Denoncé, condamné, we can only denounce, condemn, and stigmatize the actions of the supposedly brilliant men in uniform, which are unfortunately nothing more, nothing less than barbarism. How can we trust leaders incapable of protecting the population, of guaranteeing peace, justice, and love of people? How can we trust leaders who trample on religious freedom of the people, religious freedom which is the foundation of all freedom? The authorities in Equatorial Guinea say they have thwarted an attempted coup over President Teodoro Obiang in Guema in late December. At least 30 armed men were arrested recently in Cameroon, near the border with Equatorial Guinea, in relation to the attempted coup. Security Minister Nicolas Obama in Chama said radical opposition parties had recruited mercenaries to overthrow the government of President Obiang, who has been in power for nearly 40 years. An infamous, coup of, an infamous failed coup attempt was led 14 years ago by a former British soldier, Simon Mann. The former commando and businessman was arrested in Zimbabwe in 2004 and then extradited four years later to Equatorial Guinea. Some Sudanese refugees are beaming with smiles as they have now returned home from camps in the restive Central African Republic. The UN Refugee Agency carried out a voluntary repatriation of the refugees from a camp near Bambari in the CAR. 
Nearly 3,500 refugees fled from South Darfur in 2007 during fighting between the government forces and armed groups. Sudanese refugees who fled fighting in Darfur are going back home from neighboring Central African Republic, where they have lived for the last 10 years. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, has helped 1,500 of them back home as part of a voluntary repatriation exercise that started on the 12th of December 2017. UNHCR says that the security situation in Darfur has improved following a disarmament process and an ease in fighting after Sudan announced short-term truces in Blue Nile and Kordofan regions. I say a big thank you to all Central Africans. Thank you very much. I have stayed in their country for 10 years without having any worries. The Central African Republic faces its own security challenges too. Clashes between rival militias in the central region of Bambari killed dozens of people, trapping Sudanese refugees living in the Pladama Oka camp. UNHCR said that they were at high risk of attacks. Despite the risk in Central African Republic, some Sudanese refugees were not ready to leave just yet. The people who left wanted to go. I've suffered a lot in the CAR. It was the same in Sudan. There was peace. We would go about our business. Our children went to school without a worry. But then, two or three years ago, everything fell apart. The Salika came and destroyed everything, and there was no room for us. The UNHCR saved us. Here, there is room for us. We can't go to market, but at least our children can go to school. And that's why I decided to stay here, to stay with my children and wait until total calm has returned to my country before I decide to leave. UNHCR says it will continue to support those who have chosen to remain behind. According to the United Nations estimates, there are 650,000 Sudanese refugees living in Chad and South Sudan. In Egypt, footballers living with disabilities are aspiring to have a football league of their own. A group of crutch-bearing soccer players have formed a team they hope will be a part of a football league for people with special needs. More than 20 years after losing a leg in a road accident, Mahmoud Tafik feels closer to realizing his dream of becoming a football player. The 28-year-old who gained fame after a photograph of him jumping on the pitch celebrating Egypt's World Cup qualification went viral last year, is now captain of Egypt's first amputee football team. 25 players from different parts of the country gather twice a week to train on a pitch in Cairo, aiming to eventually become Egypt's first recognized professional amputee football team. We have players from different parts, such as Alexandria and Monofea. In each governorate, we're asking players to make a team to spread the game. Secondly, we went to the Paralympics committee and they were extremely receptive. We are advancing in positive steps to present the project to them. And God willing, we will go to the Minister of Youths and Sports. Though complaining of limited access to playgrounds and pitches, the team eyes up spreading the beautiful game in Egypt to the disabled. They want to establish a local federation which could regulate a domestic league for people living with disabilities. Despite their optimism, the team faces daily financial challenges, a lack of special playing crutches, as well as having difficulties finding a regular pitch for training. We are moving in steps depending on the capabilities we have. The pitches are difficult. The youth center ban anyone from training, except for academics that are already present. We face difficulties in reserving a pitch and training too. The rules for amputee football differ from association football, with seven-leg amputee players on each opposing team. The goalie has to have only one arm. Crutches are not allowed to touch the ball, and there are no offsides or limits to substitutions. Players have to constantly train their leg to ensure strength, speed, and skill.
And with that, we draw the curtain on the program Network Africa. Many thanks for watching. I'm Ayotunde Balupe.